Welcome in the latest episode of that SEC podcast. I'm your host, Mike Braddon. I go by SEC Mike on Twitter. And I'm joined, as always, by my cousin Shane, who goes by Big Orange Balls on Twitter. What are you up to, you big Tennessee homer? <laughs> hey, buddy, what's going on? Oh, man, we were just talking off air. This is going to be a great show. There's very few, Shane, that we got this much fun SEC discussion here in the yeah. off season. This feels like a, a mid season week right here with all this content we got. How you doing, brother? Oh man, we got coaches getting upset. We got <laughs> players making bold comments. This is what this is college football, baby. You know, yeah. I mean, I know we're 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 just in March, but man, we this is the momentum that is going to carry throughout the summer. And yep. so when these teams meet, you know, you're going to have these – everybody bookmarking them right now. They're taking receipts because the <laughs> somebody's got to pay the popper at some point. So, man, I'm, I'm great, brother. I love this content, and I'm looking forward to the show. Well, let's start with uh, perhaps the, the most fun comments over the week here in the SEC, Shane. This comes courtesy of a really good show, Bussin' with the Boys. Yeah. They went down there to South Carolina, got Shane Beamer – uh, for uh, an interview so shout out to them go check that full interview out if you haven't checked it out but one thing i love about shane beamer cousin shane not to be confused yeah. but <laughs> one thing i love about him and people give him crap for all this but uh he doesn't play this game that a lot of these coaches do where they you know coach speak and uh he really kind of wears his emotions on his sleeves win mm-hmm. or lose it's you know, it could be a roller coaster, and he's gotten, I won't say in trouble in any of these press conferences, but he's, I know he's, uh, you know, again, let his emotions show and credit, again, this interview for getting him to, to kind of go where I think very few SEC coaches would be willing to go on the record. Who does Shane Beamer want to throw down with? <laughs> I am saying, if you could fight one SEC coach, who would that coach be? If I could fight him or power slap, power slap, maybe power yeah. slap, yeah, the power slap one SEC coach. Who would it be? Two, two questions. This is this is developing. Yeah, who would you want to fight, and who do you think you could beat in a fight? <laughs> this is hard hitting journalism. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Journalism. I hope who, you're enjoying yourself. Who, we really are. No, I feel. I'm sure you. I feel like you are. <laughs> okay, you didn't. No, you didn't reciprocate. That's okay. Yeah, I, I feel like I'm having a good time. Yeah. Um. There's a few I could say that certainly at times I've definitely uh, would want to fight with, yeah. fight as well. We sit in those head coaches meetings and it's we're all competitors and we're intense and it's uh, there's great respect for one another. But there's things that happen outside that room and things like that that you're kind of like, David. come on, man. I, I'm not gonna say a name. Yeah, that's uh, fair. That's but fair. There, there's a few. And who would I? Uh, who do I feel like I could take? I don't know. I worked with. Um, I worked with uh, Sam Pittman at Georgia. I worked with Kirby when I was at Georgia. So, I mean, I know both those guys well. Um, I feel like from a quickness standpoint, agility, all that, I could probably take Sam, you know. Um, he may beat all me right. like, in a beer drinking contest or something yeah. like that, I'm sure. But Sam and, I, <clears throat> Sam and I were neighbors at South Carolina. So, and he's a little bit older than me. So, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, uh, neighbors yeah. at Georgia. So, I don't know. There's a few. I mean, I'm... Not to toot my own horn, but I stay pretty active and I try and work out regularly and things like that. You look that. fantastic. So, well, I appreciate you saying you that. You look well. Um, so I, I really feel like I could hold my own and be okay with all 13 other ones in that room. I mean, there'd be some battles, but, but uh, you know, there's a few in particular that I would be a priority at the top of the list, maybe. On your after. schedule, who's a team that you love to obviously be up late in the fourth quarter and grinning, thinking, I got you, motherfucker? <laughs> Um, my wife and I literally just had that conversation this morning about a team in the SEC that goes back to who I'd want to fight right now as well. Yeah. There's one in particular right now that I'm not really high on. And my wife literally just said, you know, we need this year when we play them, yada, yada, yada. So ask me again. Y'all come back during the season and we'll Fuck, talk about I want to know we'll, now. We'll talk about, will you tell us off camera? I'll tell you off camera. All right, we'll tweet it. We'll tweet it. Just record him. Like, uh, all right. What'd you yeah, say? Yeah, 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 yeah. Totally off, totally off the record. <laughs> all right, Chase. So, hey, right there, oh, South Carolina yeah. coach. Wouldn't give names for obvious reasons, but uh, one or two on his Mike, list. Let's, 
let's just let's just guess. I've got it narrowed down to three, obviously, right? So you got uh-huh. Stoops mm-hmm. is probably my favorite right now, especially with the comments made in, in last off season. Yep. Um, I, I think Eli and Hype are the other two. I mean, is there a fourth name that maybe you would consider there? Hmm. A fourth name, perhaps, perhaps old Billy Napier. And, okay. and I don't think there's any bad blood, but I think that was uh, that game caused South Carolina. Because you got to remember, man, we we have such short term memories, Shane. After they got whooped by Florida, mm-hmm. I mean, there was major concerns. I think that was that may have been the game where uh, Spencer Rattler, you know, kind of came out and was basically said, "Well, he didn't call out the play calling, but he kind of yeah. did." You know what I mean? Yeah. That was, it was one. It was in that vein of games. I mean, things were trending. Dangerously, people were wondering, "What are we doing here? We're losing to Missouri. We're losing to Florida by a wide margin." And then, of course, they turned it right around, beat the hell out of Tennessee, snapped the Clemson streak, and we just forget that happened. So, right. I'm not sitting here saying, you know, we should focus on the negative. We should focus on the positive. But I wonder if uh, losing to Billy Napier in a fashion they did, only score of that game came on a fake punt, if memory serves. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I I would think Shane Beamer was pretty fired up, and yeah. and I I don't know if that's you know against Billy Napier or anything, but he I bet he he probably wanted to fight him that night. Yeah, that that's a good point, Mike. You know, because obviously the season ended well with South Carolina. You you kind of forget. I didn't forget. There's a reason that I never bet on South Carolina for the longest time was because of that game. I thought there is no way that South Carolina is going to beat anybody in the SEC. They kind of hit rock bottom and. And so maybe that was a, a momentum, um, like kind of a momentum factor for for uh, Beamer. You know, you hit rock bottom, and then that yeah. that that one last bully calls you calls you a fat ass or something. You're like, damn, you know what? I'm going to start working out tomorrow. <laughs> and you put his face up there, and you're like, that's your momentum. Maybe Billy was what lit the fire uh, under his ass and, and got South Carolina where they're at. So yeah. I could see that. I could absolutely see that. I am curious though, Mike. I, I, out of the out of the group, I mean. Yeah. It, he was pretty confident that that he could beat up just about any coach in the <laughs> SEC. Did you feel that? I, I would, if I'm putting anybody, let's just put a short list here of, mm-hmm. of coaches that it would be close. And you may you may disagree with with me here, but I would think, of course, Coach Lee is going to be on that list. Uh, oh, yeah. Athletic, former player. You know, he, of course, he's he's kind of got those crazy eyes. He looks like a good scrapper. <laughs> Billy Napier. I mean, say what you want. He, athletic, built, still. I think you know, you know, he jokes about running around Sam Pittman and stuff. But Sam gets a hold of you. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and old, that old man strength get a hold of you. You know, I. But that that's the ones I'm thinking of is, is maybe like Billy or Billy, uh, Coach Lee. Uh, maybe Kirby, uh, you know, that's the is one anybody... I was going to go with Shane Kirby smart. I think you're underrating. I mean, he's still yeah. relatively uh, a, a very young coach given his success. We've seen yeah. him on the sideline. He's got a vertical. that's about 35 Absolutely. inches. I mean, yeah. that's, that's lower body strength, Shane. I mean, he's probably got some, some helicopter kicks in him or something. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Former <laughs> standout defensive yeah. back. I'm sure he's lost a step like we all do when we get a little bit older, but he doesn't look like he's lost much of a step. So I'd, I'd put Kirby right near the top of that list too. Yeah, I would say Kirby. I'd got Kirby in there too. Kirby, and he's a little crazy too. And, you know, those, those defensive backs, they ain't right sometimes, you know. So, uh, yeah, so I guess that's – I guess we're all in the same 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 boat here. So, uh, but, yeah, pretty pretty confident in that. So I, I love yeah. – and I don't want to – I don't want to just like – shit on South Carolina because this is what we want Mike this is what we complain about when you hear Nick Saban come out and say the same old same old about UT Chattanooga or you know it's just why let's just be real let's talk real and I appreciate this so I love the confidence it's 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 with the players too which you'll hear here in a second so that whole team is glowing and I love that Oh, all right. So you want to play the clip too of uh, the defensive yeah. back? Okay, so absolutely. They also Let's get got, it all out there. They got Spencer Rattler and Juice Wells, standout receiver, preseason All American. Who does he respect out there in the SEC when it comes to defensive backs? Short answer, but I think it's the right one. Who's the? Uh, who do you respect the most as a corner in in the SEC? None of. 
killer mentality right here, man. I respect nobody. I go out there to kill. You know what I'm saying? If I feel like I got like respect for anybody or something like that, then I feel like it's gonna like, you know, throw me off my game. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Like I'm here to get money just like he is. You know what I'm saying? So you know, respect. When we in them lines, I can be playing my blood brother, whoever it is, you're gonna get this work. Well, okay, yeah. All right, Chase. So, oh, I mean, that list is non-existent there. And, and again, you got to love the confidence that uh, that we're seeing out of Columbia. If nothing else, they're they're number one in the power rankings of confidence going into the year. You know what? Yeah. Who do you got your eye on in the SEC? I mean, which cornerback do you think playing South Carolina? Do you think is like okay? I, because I the first one that popped up in my mind was that Missouri game. Uh, yeah. You know those dudes coming back. It, it, it was it was pretty shut down, on, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Uh, Georgia obviously had a lot of turnover, so you know not going to probably be the same. But still, you know they love these they love these little things that they can put in the locker room. No specific name here, Shane, because yeah, I think it's got to be the entire secondary. But if I'm a Tennessee coach, I'm a Tennessee player. I'm putting on that the damn highlights from that in yeah. the locker room every single day because they toasted your ass, cost you a yeah. uh, shot, obviously, at the uh, college football playoff. And if that's not motivation, I don't know what is. Uh, I think Tennessee's entire secondary, not to say I like the matchup because of, because of some words he said, I, I would still significantly favor Juice Wells going up against Tennessee's secondary. But how many times have we seen it, Shane, where – you know, you run your mouth and then all of a sudden uh, you regret it down the line. So uh, yeah. I'm not saying that will happen, but they got to be or, pretty motivated after, after hearing this. Or you don't, you know. I mean, to be fair, this could go the other way. You, you may have a team that comes out super confident. We're talking about this tough schedule they got out of the gate. Right. What if they run that table, you know, and then we're looking back saying, well, damn, maybe they were on to something. Maybe there was a reason for this confidence. So, Right. Um, I love it. I want my players like this. I want my coach like this. Uh, and it, but along the way, you're going to piss off 13 other fan bases, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe, maybe not the best comparison, Shane. But last season, remember, it was all Alabama, all off season. Yeah. And then what happened? Georgia come out here and beat the hell out of Oregon. What was it, 55 to three? I mean, right. it could have been 105 to three. Yeah. It shifted quickly. Oh, God, <laughs> Georgia's <laughs> a machine. And maybe not on the same level. Again, these comparisons may not be fair, but LSU, the year they ran through college football, they were not even picked to win the SEC West. They go on the road. They beat Texas. They, they just start that roll. Uh, so you, you may be on to something there, Shane. You know, you get that early season yeah. confidence. And, uh, again, the back half of South Carolina's schedule is extremely – manageable so if they come out firing whew, it's gonna be a good year yeah, for them you know what? absolutely absolutely well hell georgia georgia last year at tennessee you know they come out we called them they can't do this the fan base ain't loud enough and buddy they they turned on another switch so <laughs> yep. you know maybe maybe that's the confidence coming into the season that this team needs to be convinced that they can compete with the top All right, Shane, well, we got a lot to get to, so let's get down to Tuscaloosa next where they have opened spring practice there at Alabama. And my goodness, Shane, (laughs) not even 100% sure this was intentional, but I don't – anyone saying otherwise I think is being disingenuous because our man Nick Saban kind of threw down a gauntlet here and it wouldn't have been as bad – if he didn't say exactly what he said, you know, we've stayed away. We, we don't cover basketball and all that and all, yeah. but everybody knows the story by now. The best player in the country, Brandon Miller, everything going on with that. His coach comes out here and says, Hey, he was at the wrong place at the wrong time. The, the moments after it was revealed yeah. that, uh, you know, he was at the scene and he brought and, and there was a, he brought the weapon and all that. No need to go into that. But Nick Saban day one, announced a suspension of true freshman Tony Mitchell and listen to what Nick Saban has to say here. Uh, Tony Mitchell has been suspended from the team uh, on all team activities until we gather more information about the situation and what his legal circumstance is. And, um, you know, I mean, 
guys, everybody's got an opportunity to make choices and decisions. There's no such thing in being at the wrong place at the wrong time. You got to be responsible for who you're with, who you're around, and what you do, who you associate yourself with, and uh, the situations that you put yourself in. So um, it is what it is, but uh, there is, you know, cause and effect when you make, you know, choices and decisions that uh, put you in bad situations. So. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it's it's one of two things, Shane. I mean, yeah. it's Nick Saban knew exactly what he was doing because he's the smartest guy in college football. He's a legend. He's the greatest college football coach of all time. Every time he sits at that podium, Shane, he either has a message to get out there yeah. to his team, to college football, to the media, whatever it is. And I think he sent this one out to Alabama, to NATO, saying – you know, I think in his mind, Shane, and and he's got every reason to feel this way. I think I don't think he's happy with uh, you know how they've been dealing with things and and what a circus all that has become at the with the basketball program because it is it, it's basically it's the University of Alabama, but it's basically Nick Saban yeah. University. You know what I mean? He runs that thing, and I, and they're shedding like a bad light on the whole university, which reflects on his football team. That's just my opinion. Either that or Nick Saban is just completely clueless to the biggest story in all of college sports, which is happening on his campus. You be the judge. It's, it's one or the other. A little bit of that, a little bit. I mean, I, I guess you could go either way, but I, I think you hit the nail on the head at the start of this. Is Saban has a message, and a lot of times it's for his own team. You know, that it doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what star you have, doesn't matter how much money you got in your bank account, you know, you still are going to be held reliable for the decisions you make. And, and this, this, and I don't want to sound like my papa, man, but this generation's different, you know, and, you know, I've got 10 years between my kids, and, and, and in 10 years, the the amount of respect that has gone away with some of these kids is amazing. And I'm not looping them all in there because there's some great kids out there. I'm sure there's some great kids on that campus. But now these kids got millions of dollars in their bank account. You know what I'm saying? They, these kids yeah. want for nothing when they're down there, and, and they're going to be held to a higher standard because of that. And the decisions that they make are going to impact everybody. So this was a message, man. This was a message to that, that, that staff, to these players players that it doesn't matter who the hell you are if you get caught doing something you're not supposed to you will not be on this team we will find someone to replace you so um i think it's a bold comment and obviously with everything else that's going on down there on that campus this was a um it, it went viral real quick i'll tell you that but uh <laughs> but I, I think it was a message that he just wants to get out there early he doesn't right. want it lingering around and uh for those that don't know shane five star Tony Mitchell, one of the top corners in the country. A and M wanted him. Um, I mean, I mean, everybody in the in the country yeah. wanted him. Uh, he was committed to Tennessee long, long ago under Jeremy Pruitt. I mean, he's he's been a one of the top prospects since he was about a freshman in high school. But and hey, innocent till proven guilty. I'm not yeah convicting him of anything. But this is no, according no, no. to the according yeah. to the police report, Shane. 141 miles per hour he was doing, evading police, and had. Half a pound of marijuana on his possession. <laughs> Jeez. Jeez. So Why I don't know if he's going to be. Me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. I went down there. Don't start that rumor. I, I thought the one of the funniest uh, comments to come out, um, I want to give this guy a shout out. Paul T. Graham, you sent this to me. I thought it was freaking hilarious. Saban said, there's no such thing as being in the wrong place at the wrong time. And he goes, yes, hell there is. Let's discuss our defensive backs trying to cover Jalen Hyatt last October. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's not all Nick Saban had to say, Shane, of course. Uh, you know, the offensive line, the, the, when they hired Tommy Reese, you know, that a lot of people yeah. scratching their head. But, uh, you know, talking to people, it, it's kind of clear what they're trying to do now at Alabama. They want to get away a little bit from being so dependent on a star quarterback and star receivers because they, I, they've just not had all those pieces or at least have those pieces healthy. And without it, the way Alabama's constructed, you can't win an Astro championship. So they, they want to go back a little bit more to be run heavy offensive yeah. line led the way. Nick Saban says we need to get bigger, more physical on that offensive line. And it sounds like they may be adding some more pieces if possible this off season. 
Um, and I also thought this was great, Shane, how he makes it clear every season to him, it's like a brand new, it's like taking over the job for the first year. And it really is that way with all these new coordinators, uh, new quarterback, Will Anderson gone. So let's kick it over to Nick Saban, who touches on that as well. You're in the middle there. I know they haven't had an opportunity to do much yet, but just looking at the offensive line, you have a lot of big-bodied, big-statured guys. <clears throat> do you anticipate that being a group that's powerful and, and moving people at the point of attack? You know, I like the players that we have in the offensive line. Uh, I think we have some bigger, more physical players. Uh, I think they, they obviously don't have as much experience, uh, but I like the attitude. I like their temperament. I like their toughness. And I think the number one thing is we got to create some depth, you know, at that position. Uh, we probably lost more players than we gained, even though the players that we gained, we're excited about how they can contribute and what their future might be. Um, so we probably need to, to add a little depth at that position. Hi, Coach. When you come into spring and you know that you are obviously losing some key leadership roles and also some key starters, and you mix that in with now two new coordinators, what's the biggest challenge for you as the head coach entering into the spring with all those changes? And what's possibly the benefit or the most fun for you knowing that you get to kind of set a whole new scheme here? Well, I, I've said this before, but I look at every season like I just took the job. So if I just took the job, what would we have? We'd have new coaches. We'd have new leadership. We'd have to create a new culture on this team. We'd have to create new leadership on our team from players as well as coaches. I would have to make sure that the coaches really understood the culture and the system that we wanted to play, whether it was offense, defense, or special teams. It's great to have continuity, especially in leadership positions, but uh, this is not something that we don't have some experience at making sort of adaptations, being flexible, uh, letting people add things that they know will be beneficial to us, um, contribute to how we can fix some of the problems that we've had in the past. Uh, new energy and new enthusiasm is always helpful. So uh, that's what we're basically going to you know, try to do with the new people that we have. Uh, and you know, hopefully we'll have some players that step up and uh, become leaders. But they're going to have to earn the right to do that. You know, I haven't, we haven't picked a leadership group yet. We have an advisory committee. Uh, and what the advisory committee is supposed to do is go back to their room, to their group, and advise them of my and our message that they all need to understand. Whoever does that the best has obviously got a chance to be a leader. But we haven't decided who that is yet. So they have to earn the right to do that. All right, Shane. So, yeah, I mean, I mean interesting stuff, I think, from Nick Saban. But, uh, you know, certainly – We'd be foolish to doubt the greatest of all time, but uh, there is a ton of turnover. And the fact that they are making this transition with, you know, they, they got talented quarterbacks. I'm not trying to disrespect mm -hmm. Jalen Milrow or, or Ty Simpson, but both of those guys largely inexperienced. I don't know. Just what's your thoughts, Shane, on all the transition and, uh, and how, how quickly they can get – because, again, the standard at Alabama, 10-2, 11-1, it is – you know, you don't have to go undefeated, but you do got to win a national championship. Otherwise, the season is basically a disappointment. This this isn't uncharted territory for, for Saban. You know, it seems like we're, we're having the same conversation every year. Like, you know, there's a lot of turnover because these guys went to the NFL. Well, they've been doing that for a long time, Mike. So <laughs> Saban's usually good at getting the the best out of the out of the the newest. You know, I, I'm I am not discouraged. Last year was kind of a one off, but it, was it really? You know, a couple if those two, if two games would have ended just a little bit different. We'd be talking about another fantastic season from Nick Saban. So mm -hmm. I, I'm not worried uh, uh, about this, but I do like them kind of getting back to the roots a little bit because you see what's working these days. And, you know, a lot of it is that, that trench warfare. And you do that with those big uglies up front. They are loaded up, you know, but – Saban's quick to point out that depth is a concern, which it always will be in the SEC. So you got to have you got to have plenty of rooms, uh, plenty of people in those rooms. So um, I have full confidence in, in Saban and, and Crimson Tide here. Yeah, and one last thing to add on Alabama, Shane, you got to remember that uh, you know they had some offensive linemen specifically transfer out. 
They, they had a few players transfer out. They only brought two transfers in, which, if memory serves, that is probably the least amount Alabama has brought in since the transfer portal came into effect. They could still add more during the summer, of course, but I, I think what that tells me, Shane, is that Nick Saban – really likes his roster overall. He likes the chemistry. There's going to be some new faces making plays, but, uh, you know, it, rarely does his chemistry seem like an issue down there at Alabama, and certainly talent is never an issue. So um, I, much like, again, I, ha- I hate to just make these comparisons over and over and over, but it's kind of like Georgia last right. offseason. They didn't add – I don't think they added anybody via the portal. So uh, c- because clearly – Kirby was very, very satisfied with his roster, much like I suspect Nick Saban is happy with his roster that he's working Are, with. Let me let me ask you because he kind of he kind of brings it up with with depth, and obviously you know there's a lot of buzz about you know some of these freshmen that they brought in, mm-hmm. but they're freshmen, you know, and. How many times have we got to the end of the season and we said injuries plagued a team and then these, you know, we had a young offensive line and, you know, a new quarterback. This is – I'm not saying this is the direction that that's going to happen in Tuscaloosa, but I can see a scenario where we're making excuses at the end of the year because they got a, a lot of young people on that front. Um, I, are you worried at, about that at all? Because, you know, when I think of some of the great – SEC programs that come through a lot of that is senior led offensive line you know that's got plenty of snaps under their belt we're not going to see that and we're one injury away from having you know a true freshman potentially suit up there yeah I mean I guess when you put it like that that is somewhat concerning particularly when the emphasis does seem to be on on running the ball and leading the way with that offensive line so yeah, I mean, you could just never tell. Those guys do get banged up quite a bit with all the physicality down there, especially in the SEC. Add Texas to that list, which mm-hmm. I know they hated the tech in the SEC yet, but uh, you know they're building that thing up to where they can compete on this level. So yeah, I mean, it's it's never easy in the SEC. So that is certainly something that could potentially derail uh, the hopes of of Alabama's season next year you know what yeah i think i think that's the key they're going to be as good as that offensive line allows him and, and one one final question on that note is uh the portal so if, i know there's another window and is there potential in this portal for players to come in and start this season or is that window shut um no it it's kind of confusing you can't take another sec player uh-huh. and have them come in and start because that window has passed. Now, there is an exception if they graduate. You know, they still have that rule now to where you could be a graduate transfer. That does not apply. But, yeah, uh, you know, Alabama could grab someone from the Big Ten or the ACC or the Pac-12 or whatever, and that does not apply either. So, right. um, basically, they just have this rule in so that – these SEC coaches don't steal each other's plays, players in the summer and fall training camp and and have them be immediate eligibility. But, again, if you're graduating from your former school, they can't stop it. So, so yes or yeah. no to answer your question. Very okay, confusing. I, well, and I'm, I'm just interested, you know, if, if, you know, if that window is still open for those guys. I, if, you know, because he did point out that they lost more than they gained and – you know, that's that's not what you want to hear coming into a season. So I'm wondering if yeah. maybe they bring a few more guys in just to to, to round out that, that group. Well, speaking of uh, somewhat of a concern here, Shane, I w- normally I would have led with this because it's pretty explosive stuff in my opinion. But let's kick it all down to College Station. <laughs> well, man, I got to be honest, Shane, after, you know, last week we were talking returning production, A&M number one in the SEC, top ten in the country, bringing back all these pieces. Um, I believe only three starters from last season's win over LSU will not be returning, and those three are off to the NFL. We had Anaya Smith make a surprising decision to return just a couple weeks ago. Things are looking good. I loved the Bobby Petrino hire for what that could add to the Texas A&M football program. But again, I'm not. I'm trying not to overreact here, Shane. It's March 21st as we're sitting here recording. But my goodness, Shane, 
Jimbo started. did not want to get into this at all to open spring. Let's kick it over to Jimbo. I mean, this is a this is like five questions he's got to answer on the offense, <laughs> what it's going to look like, Bobby Petrino, yep. what the hell you doing bringing this guy in here, all on and on and on. This is some wild stuff. So uh, let's kick it over to Jimbo. Jimbo, how much difference can we can uh, with our be in the in the offense, and how much control? Now we ain't worried about. Here's what we're doing. How much control does Bobby have? We're running our thing. We're going to be base fundamentals. We ain't getting into scheme. We ain't getting into anything. That's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to practice. And what we're going to do on a daily basis. When you have to get into scheme. What we put in that day, and then we'll be base fundamental. How you execute your scheme is what's about fundamentals. Thanks. Yeah, bro, uh what is it about Bobby philosophically that you like about as what he's done in the past and, and uh, what he brings to this program? Yeah, I mean, Bobby's an experienced guy who's called plays and done a great job, and he's got a really good foundation and fundamentals of football, which have great balance, whether it's running the ball, throwing the ball, and has been able to be very productive in the things he's been able to do. Yeah, bro, uh what is it about Bobby philosophically that you like about as what he's done in the past and, and uh, what he brings to this program? Yeah, I mean, Bobby's an experienced guy who's called plays and done a great job, and he's got a really good foundation and fundamentals of football, which have great balance, whether it's running the ball, throwing the ball, and has been able to be very productive in the things he's been able to do. How would you describe similarities and differences between you two philosophically? Uh, we ain't got enough times on hours on day to do all that. <laughs> but at the end of the day, we're all, we believe in one thing, execution. So at the end of the day, that's what it's about. Right, an over route's an over route. A dig's a dig. How you get there, what you do, and it's we get so caught up in ex, it's not scheme, it's execution, and then that goes back to how do you execute fundamentals, alignment, assignment, technique, no matter what you do. And if you and if you want to know technicals, if you go watch everybody in the country, everybody does the same thing. Go watch film. If you sit down and watch film. There's not a hill of beans between anybody. As far as what goes on, what routes are, what plays are, it's a counter is a counter, a dig and a post is a dig and a post, a verticals are verticals. I mean, it's all the same. It gets back to execution and fundamentals. Left, front, up. So help me out. So you, you, hiring Petrino is going to help your execution. Am I correct when you're saying it gets down to execution? Whatever you see that he does comparable it's to going you, to allow us some thing. I think he's a very good coach, and and I think he'll help help us offensively. Yes. Execution. But mm -hmm. so what, what, that's what, that's what coaching is. I mean, at the end of the day, it gets yeah. back to being able to execute what you do and be able to be consistent in what you have to do. Yeah, just trying to see that you guys are a little more comparable so you feel the execution will be there better. Well, hopefully. It, I mean, that's what we're here to try. To based <laughs> off our fundamentals and our work habits and what we do on a daily basis, that's what we'll get back to. And, and what about who, ma who makes the play calls? Would that be him or you? Yeah, I mean, we'll go through that as we go. Go back to the back. Plan on him right. making calls. Plan on him calling plays. I have no problem with that at all. Kind of feels like Jimbo's the only one not excited about bringing in Bobby <laughs> Petrino. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad you said that, Shay, because well, twofold. I'll get I'll get to that in just a second. But you know, knowing the coaches, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to sit here and lie and say I know all of them and, and I'm good buddies or anything like that. But in the spring, these guys are always in a better mood. There's no pressure. Uh, you know, yes. things are slower. You're teaching, developing. It's We usually don't see this to the fall, Shane, when an unexpected loss happens. It feels just, again, maybe I'm overreacting here, but it feels like, the pressure is on Jimbo to such an extent here that, uh, you know, he can't even answer a simple question of who's calling the plays. Is it going to be Bobby Petrino? You know, is it going to be you? What, what's the system? I mean, he's, he's getting short. He's cutting people off. He did, you know, eventually after basically moving on to the next person admitting, hey, yeah, Bobby, Bobby's going to call plays. I don't have a problem with that. Who in the hell, Shane, hires a coordinator – and then when asked if they're going to let them call plays, says, I don't have a problem with that. I mean, that is not, to me, sounding like someone that is, is very open and willing to that person coming in and calling the shots. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I'm just baffled by this. And it, it, it feels like, you know, that marriage is, again, it's very, very early, but it feels like it's already tenuous. Well... It is, and it's discouraging. It's discouraging. How can you be a fan of Texas A&M 
and, and, you know, we talked about Alabama earlier with some excuses that could happen. And obviously Texas A&M had a lot of bad things happen. Injuries, you know, kids getting in trouble, whatnot. There, I mean, you could point fingers at whoever. But the fact of the matter is the product was pathetic last year on the field. It was just abysmal at times, and it was just tough to watch. And so – we convinced the whole nation that, hey, we're going to fix it. We're going to get better. I'm going to bring in uh, a, a different eyes. I'm going to bring in a different style of offense here. It's going to help jump start what we're trying to do down here in College Station. And then you come out here in the spring, before you even really took serious snaps, being discouraging that you're going to relinquish those reins. And, and so – naturally you're going to be a little bit skeptical coming into the season and yes he is on the hottest of hot seats mike i honestly i i think if there was he's got six games in my opinion you got the miami game you got the arkansas game you got the bama game that's all played within six you got tennessee right after that so it ain't getting any easier but i it would not surprise me that if this goes bad those first six games that we lose jimbo so to do that, to, to to start out of the gate on the right path and, and correct what you're going to do, you've got to convince me that you're doing everything you can to not repeat the performance you had last season. So you bring in a, an offensive coordinator. You should sell him. You're selling him to me. You're not – You're not. I don't need to be convinced that you know offense, Jimbo. I need to be convinced that you're willing to adapt to this, this day and age college football. Right, and him just saying, I mean, my God, I mean, basically saying, well, all offense is the same. <laughs> I mean, I I probably have a lower football intellect than <laughs> most people, <Yeah. Absolutely. laughs> despite what I do here. But uh, you cannot tell me that you watch Tennessee and you watch Texas A&M and say, oh, yeah, it's the same. It's the same yeah. damn thing. It's, it's just execution. <laughs> it's a dig. It's a curl round. That's all it is. Same thing. <laughs> I, mean, I mean that's laughable and i mean that those are comments from a guy that is uh, seemingly totally out of touch with what is happening and how pathetic the offense is and again this is not this is not me railing on the university or the program or anything like this this is all jimbo's shoulders and that is why bringing bobby petrino in who despite you know i've heard he's pretty much a scumbag <laughs> Off the field, he is a, a genius play caller. He'll get them. Yeah. He'll get more out of quarterbacks and play calling than many coaches we have seen in the SEC. You let him do that. You manage the program like we know you can. I mean, this has the potential to be a grand slam. But again, the first day of spring practice, and we're already tenuous is the is the best word I keep coming up with. But I mean, I mean, the tension is is palpable there. Well, and it makes you wonder, what is it really like in that locker room? What is it like on that sideline, you know? Bobby quit another job for – I mean, I know he only worked there like two days, but you know, he quit another <laughs> job to come over here and help Texas A&M. And, and yeah, if he, you come over here and you're handcuffed and you can't, you, you can't run the offense you want to run – you know, he's you're going to be the scapegoat. People are going to he's going to try to blame you. And and so I I'm I'm very discouraged with how this was handled. Now, obviously you filtered out several of the questions. I don't know. There may have been 30 other B Bobby Petrino questions or roundabout <laughs> ways of doing it, but you know, he is he is the big switch down there and this is what we again, you need to as a head coach, as a general manager, you're also a salesman. You need to come out here and convince us that this is why I brought him in here to help us get to from point A to point B. It's not saying that Jimbo can't coach. Jimbo needs to coach, but he needs to be more of a general manager instead of focused on one side of the ball. Yeah, and, and I do like the fact, again, I'm trying not to pile on here, Shane, last thing from A&M, he was asked about Connor Wigman, the star quarterback who came in late in the season, showcased a ton of talent, and could take a big leap in year two in college football with Bobby Petrino working with him. Uh, how's his, you know, is it his job just basically and, and no competition? That's not the way they're running it here in College Station. And I think given uh, last season, some of the off-the-field issues, I think this is the perfect answer from Jimbo. Travis? 
Jimbo, last year you had Connor start the last four games of the season. Is it an open competition between him and Matt? Every right position now? is an open competition. That's what spring's about. You, nobody has anything. I don't care what position you are. You've got to prove yourself each and every day. Each and every day you've got to go out there. And, the, and then the guys who play with the most consistency will be the guys that play. I don't care if it's quarterback, running back, OL, DL, safety, punter, kicker, snapper. I mean, all the way across the board. That's, it's about one thing, competition. What is your – was your competition, your, your ability to compete, and then your productivity. And then you brought in. I'm already out of beer. I'm talking about Jimbo Fisher. I have to go <laughs> get another one. He's already getting me going, Mike. <laughs> well, I, hey, I'll, I'll brighten the mood for you right here, Shay. Let's kick it all down to Knoxville where Tennessee has open spring uh, this week as well. Josh Heupel met with the media and, you know, Big things on his mind, of course. Everyone's going to ask about Nico. Everybody wants to know about Joe Milton. But what yeah. I really like, let's open with this, Shane, the depth and the overall talent. And we're starting to filter in more. And you got to remember, Shane, all this success Tennessee's have, I mean, aside from portal players and, and a couple of freshmen, I mean, these are basically – Josh Heupel's been having a ton of success – with guys that he didn't even hand select, is guys yeah. he inherited. Now we're getting more and more guys that that they have actually recruited into the program to to ideally fit the system. Let's kick it over to Josh Heupel on uh, what the look of this roster in spring. Coach, you're, where's you're, Jimmy? Come on, you're, you're three, and I know every team is different. How is this one different? How much more depth do you have? How how different does it feel rolling into the spring with this team? Yeah, I think for, for you guys, you walk out there, you can see the difference in depth really at, at every position. Um, you know, the new guys, the young guys that we've added, length, athleticism, uh, size on the, uh, the offensive and defensive lines, um, you know, much deeper than we've been. Uh, skill spots, uh, same thing. Um, you know, for us, um, you know, this spring we're truly going to be able to get reps uh, for an entire uh, roster of, of guys. And, you know, year one we were a shell of, of just numbers but athletes on the grass uh, that we are today. And, and uh, so that allows you to, you know, increase the number of reps that you're going to get during the spring. And uh, it also creates a ton of competition and, and uh, urgency uh, from the meeting rooms to what you're doing on the practice field. And, you know, the seven weeks that we had uh, before spring break uh, have been great, um, great competition. Guys made a bunch of strides, changing their bodies, uh, starting to learn our schemes. Um, but today is, is day one, putting the helmets on and, and uh, getting out there and, and doing some things for real. All right, Shane, and, and you know, you got to remember, I mean, there was times uh, the last couple of years where Tennessee couldn't even practice uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, up up to standard because you don't have enough linemen and you don't have right. enough of this, you don't have enough of that. And now with, uh, you know, as someone like Brew McCoy is a little dinged up, so, you know, he's limited. And normally that would be a huge cause for concern. But all that is going to do is allow some of these younger promising receivers to get reps. And that's exactly what Josh Heupel is talking about here. And, uh, you know, a big reason why I think the defense will take a step forward and why th this Tennessee program's got a lot, a lot of staying power is because we still have yet to see the best roster under uh, Josh Heupel at Tennessee that I think we're going to see this fall. Dude, I mean, we're, we're, we were a game away to making college football playoffs in year two. So year three, this is when you're supposed to be judging a coach because now they've got a couple of recruiting classes under their belt. They're established. They're on a high tra trajectory, and that's exactly where Hopple's at. So I am very encouraged because what's hurt us in the last couple of years wasn't talent, wasn't play calling. It was depth, and we've just we ran out of gas toward the end of the seasons a lot of times. So I'm encouraged that my coach is coming out here and, and letting us know that, hey, man, we're, we're a lot better off now than we were three years ago. Right. And a big part of that, Shane, I mean, he may be the, the future, may not be play a, a huge part, at least this season, is mm -hmm. uh, the five-star freshman, Nico. And, you know, you got to remember, Shane, I mean, he, they only have two scholarship quarterbacks <laughs> right now. So they have got to get him up to speed quickly because, God forbid, something happens to Joe Milton, he will be the starting quarterback. So right. it's a unique situation. But when you have a player that's some regard as the best 
prospect in the entire country, not just quarterback, but all the country coming into your program, the highest rated recruit I think I saw in 20 some odd years to come to Tennessee. What's his coachability? And, no pressure. Uh, no, yeah, no pressure. <laughs> and, and obviously Joe Milton. The pressure is on him, Shane, because yeah. he's got to replace Hendon Hooker, who had one of the best seasons we've ever seen from an SEC quarterback. Can he carry that mantle? Because mantle? we've seen him as a starter before a couple years ago, and, and it did not look good. Certainly looked good at the tail end of last season, beating Clemson. How does that translate to this upcoming season? Let's kick it over to Josh Heupel. How uh, how willing do you think Nico is to take coaching, to take instruction, and how will you determine how fast to push him in spring? Well, he's going to have to get – he's going to be pushed extremely quickly and just uh, look at where we're at at the quarterback position. So uh, great urgency is going to be needed for him. Uh, he's extremely coachable. Uh, he's got his – you know, from the moment that he stepped foot on campus, that's bowl preparation uh, to come back here uh, end of January when we started the, the winter semester. Uh, has been phenomenal. He's got great urgency. He cares a great uh, deal about uh, learning his craft, uh, learning our offense, but learning his craft at the quarterback position. Uh, takes coaching extremely well. Um, you know, he resets, moves, moves on to the next play at a, at a really high level. Um, you know, he's come in, he's worked. Um, you know, guys believe in him, and I'm just talking about how he carries himself and. Um, you know, slowly you've seen him start to, to grow into taking more ownership. He's still really young, um, but uh, I'm excited to, to have these 15 days with him. Are you with, with him in that role? Yeah, I believe Joe will be ready to play at, a, at an elite level. There's competition at every position. Um, I, you know, I've said that from the time that I've got here. I don't care how you were recruited, uh, if you were a walk-on or not. Uh, you started a game or a year ago, it doesn't matter. Um, it's about who you are today. And, and um, you know, that's why you got to be very competitive in everything that you're doing, intentional in the way that you work. Um, believe Joe will be ready to play at a really high level. But, uh, you know, there's going to be competition everywhere. All right, Shane. So, hey, based on those questions, I mean, two quarterbacks, that's dicey. I would imagine yeah. Tennessee will add someone via the transfer portal. Or, I mean, I almost feel like you have to. But uh, what's your confidence level that uh, – you know, Joe Milton can carry Tennessee to be at least a contender for the SEC East crown. Well, man, I you know me, Mike. We we talk <laughs> when we're not on the show. You know, we're in a couple of group texts, and and I'm I'm in on Milton. I, I think he has the pieces. He's he's a big body boy. Yeah. You know, you talk about. Hendon Hooker, he was a smaller guy, and, and you knew he'd get banged up at some point, you know, especially when he was mobile and trying to get outside that pocket. Milton's different. Milton's, you know, he's seven foot tall. What is he, 380 pounds, something like that, <laughs> solid as a rock, can throw 150 meters. So, I mean, the, the guy is just – he is God's – I mean, if you're looking at if you're building a quarterback on Madden, he's going to look like Joe Milton when you yeah. get done. So, I think he has those pieces, but it's between the ears. It, it's been his problem. It, it's his accuracy. And, and you saw flashes of it in that Clemson game where this guy, I'm telling you, if he builds that confidence – can be an absolute force in the SEC. Running Hopple's offense, I mean, it could get freaking dangerous because there's somebody that could really take the top off of defense. So oh, yeah. I'm 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 all in. But, you know, I got my head coach coming out here saying, you know, I need Nico to pick it up quick. You know, so, <laughs> so some some of the things he's saying makes me wonder like, why why is he why is he you know, why is he because I think we see Nico at some point during the season, maybe not as a starter, but obviously he's gonna be on the field. But if we do have an injury or something like that, this is another guy that's gotta be able to step in immediately. So um I don't know. Maybe I'm reading between the you try you know, it's what well, you always try to do. You try to figure out what these coaches are really trying to say. Let me ask you this though, because then you you made me just think of something. Would you rather have Joe Milton be so Far in a way better than Nico that it, you know we're not, it's not even a discussion. Or would you rather Nico maybe he comes out here in, in training camp? You know, as we get closer to the season, they're like, my God, this guy's a real deal, and uh, kind of not saying he wins the starting job because I, I don't think that's realistic, but maybe pushes Joe Milton to be even better. I don't, I don't know if that makes sense, but which, which would you yeah. rather have? Just Joe Milton be out of this world, or Nico kind of? 
maybe be ahead of the schedule to where he pushes Joe Milton. What's your thoughts on that? That's a great question, Mike. And I think it's different for every quarterback competition that you see in the SEC. This one in particular, I think, has more to do with psychology than it does actual attributes. And when I'm worried about Joe Milton is I'm worried about him doubting himself. So if you're asking me which one I would prefer, I would prefer Milton to be out of this world much better than Nico. So he doesn't have to keep looking over his shoulder or, hey, I've got to be perfect on this pass or Nico's coming in to take this job. You know, so I think that's what that's what he needs is just the confidence of the coaching staff, co- confidence in the fan base that this is our guy. This is the one we're going to build a, a Heisman campaign around, you know. Right. So, yes, that's that's the route I would go. But, you know, that's different for other schools. Some other schools, they need that that push to get better. I just don't think that Milton does. And last thing, real quick on Tennessee, Shane, it was announced here on Tuesday that they are going to open the 2024 season in Charlotte against NC State. Oof. Another one of these neutral – I thought we were done with neutral sites, Shane. Yeah. They're opening the, the upcoming season against Virginia in Nashville. I mean, that'll, that's Stupid. great for, for fans in the middle of the state, but <laughs> – I think they're opening 2025 on neutral, too. I mean, my God, Tennessee's about the only one still embracing this damn thing. I thought, we, I thought we were done with it. And we should be, Mike, because you remember last time we went over there, we got our asses handed to us by West Virginia. So I, I don't know if I really <laughs> am encouraging this because there's not a better – venue for a volunteer fan than right there in in Neyland. so why right. why go somewhere else when we can have fun right in our back backyard it's not like you're gonna get more fans it's we're we're on tv you know people aren't from charlotte gonna say you know what let's run up here and watch the tennessee game no <laughs> we're gonna get most of our viewership from tv which we would get whether we're in knoxville or charlotte so i am right. not a fan of this at all yeah those nfl stadiums they're just they're awful for tailgating and attendance and all that you know what exactly it's just fake and and, you know when you're watching not when you're in knoxville and you're there by the river and you could just sell that atmosphere you know that's what you're selling to your recruits that's what you're selling to your fan bases so Mm -hmm. uh you you gain in my opinion you gain nothing but money because that's what it boils down to is they're going to make some nice coin going to these stadiums Right. All right, last uh, little news item here, Shane. Let's kick it on down to LSU with the defending SEC West champs. They they opened spring, then they went on a like a 12-day break. Now they're back in spring. <laughs> I don't know why they <laughs> scheduled it out like that. But I love it. Uh, going back to A&M, I don't think these were shots at all at a and I really don't. But, you know, maybe fans will read into it. We got a little bit of a rivalry here with A&M and uh, a- LSU and mm-hmm. – Former five-star corner Denver Harris of A&M transferred into LSU. By all accounts, things are going well, and he could certainly be in line to start for LSU in that secondary. And this is the the kid, Shane, that, um, you know, there was the viral video where he's, like, driving around the parking lot going a million miles per hour and just yeah. just living life, you know what I mean? But, uh, unfortunately, you know, he, he got suspended get in, and left A&M had some maturing to do. And again, I'm not sitting here saying Brian Kelly is, is calling out the AM culture, but he certainly is pointing to the fact that LSU's culture is helping this kid uh, stay on the on the right path, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, with a guy like Denver Harrison, just given some of his history, what made you uh, feel confident that he could fit into what you're building here? Yeah, I mean, obviously we did a lot of research. You know, this was not a decision that we just said, you know, here's a great player. You know, he had to fit. We felt like, you know, we did our due diligence in terms of his background. And, um, you know, there's an affiliation with LSU here with the, with the family. Um, he had a lot of people speak on his behalf. Um, um, he had a number of interviews with, with Coach House and myself. And we felt with the, the culture in which – we have put together here um, that uh, he would um, make it here because uh, the culture is really strong. And it's proven to be that um, he's done well early on um, and and he has no choice. Um, He has to make it. Um, So 
here's a guy that, that, that has been given a second chance, and um, we feel like because of the circumstances, uh, the culture is strong. Um, he knows that this is really his last chance at an SEC opportunity, um, that it was worth the risk, and so far so good. All right, Shane, so I don't know. I, again, I'm trying not to read too much into this. I'm trying not to, to put anything on A&M that doesn't deserve to be there. But uh, after hearing these comments, do you think Brian Kelly was at all talking down to, to Jimbo's program? No, no, I, I don't think there was anything. This was more of a just a, a reminder that this is uh, LSU last stop university, you know, <laughs> <laughs> the last chance you right here, uh, you know, you got one last shot and and you can squander it very very easily. And I and I think I'm, I want to. I'm always optimistic with these kids. I'm yep. always looking, you know, where I was young, I made mistakes and thank God there wasn't internet and yep. cell phones and because I still may be locked up, you know, but <laughs> this, this is an opportunity for a do over, you know what I'm saying? And, and don't squander it kid, because you can be, this is a, this is a kid that's easily has the talent to play on Sundays one day and you, you're going to, you're going to miss it. If you, if you, he could be such an attribute for LSU and, and I, and I'm hoping that that's what, what he does here because, and I'm sure that's the conversation because he, he comes out and he says, Hey man, this is it. You know, yep. I mean, if you're coming out and you're talking to media like this, I would imagine that the closed office, you know, meeting was a little bit more stern than that. Right. And and then last thing on LSU, Shane, just want uh, to to give a positive update on Mason Smith, their outstanding defensive lineman, got hurt in the opener against Florida State. They lost him for the entire season. But the buzz out of Baton Rouge, Shane, was this guy's the best player on the team. Like he's that big of a wrecking force. Um, he, he'll be, sounds like, you know, cleared by summer, which is great news. But mm -hmm. I just think it's wild that Brian Kelly is, is basically saying – it teams are going to have to play us entirely differently with this yeah. guy on the field. He's that much of a beast. So a uh, positive update here on LSU defensive lineman Mason Smith. Uh, you saw Mason Smith running around um, doing non-contact drills. How important what, – what's the timetable for his recovery, and how important will it be to get him back in the depth chart? Well, it will be immense. I mean, you know, we didn't have, you know – a. Look, I mean, we had great edge presence last year, right? It was pretty obvious, like with with Harold and and BJ. Um, but you could fan one side and 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 chip or move the back to the other, because we didn't have a great inside pass presence, pass rush presence. Now you put Mason to the inside. If you do that this year, I don't know how many sacks he'll have. He, you can't single block him. We couldn't. Um, so when you start to fan to him, you know, and when I say fan, when you start to move the center to him or use a back inside, now you're going to leave our edge players one-on-one -on -one and we'll, we'll, have a, you know, we'll have a really good balanced pass rush. So he, he brings that presence, which we didn't have last year. We had nine guys out today that factor into our two deep and significant playing time. Eight of the nine will be back when we begin our summer program in the first week in June. The ninth is Armani, Armani Goodwin, who won't be back until camp starts. So they're all in great position. They're all doing well. They're all moving actively. Um, so, you know, we're in the middle of March. You know, these guys are, you know, on schedule to be full go, doing everything, you know, by the time we come back, um, you know, in the first week in June. All right, Chase. I mean, it's not often you get a head coach basically saying, "Well, I mean, this guy's a damn game wrecker up here." That, and, and uh -huh. you got to think of all the things they have, they achieved last year. They they did it obviously without Mason Smith. They got Harold Perkins, who's like the biggest bizarro freak in the SEC. Yeah. Your team is two together. I mean, my God, they're going to be tough to beat if uh, yeah, you know absolutely. if they both live up to the hype. You know what? He's doing a little extra dancing that night, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, this is what you want to hear. You want to talk about buzz coming into this season, brother? 
It's the LSU Tigers. There's going to be a lot of buzz coming from Baton Rouge, and, and rightfully so. And, and, you know, tenacious defense. When I think of LSU, I think of a good running game and a hell mm-hmm. of a defense. And it seems like they're putting together a hell of a defense here. Right. Well, brother, hey, that's all I got uh, on this episode of the show. Try to go around the SEC as much as possible and yeah. want to continue to do so. If we, we find these nuggets to share. Uh, you got anything else before we hop off here? No, man, I'm telling you, this is crazy. This is March, man. You would think this is like <laughs> September already. Uh, so great, great, great stuff coming out. Um, look forward to the next show. And be sure if you've not subscribed yet, get on the YouTube. If you're curious how good looking we are, you can subscribe there and be <laughs> notified every time we put a highlight out or a short. Because Mike, what else is Mike's doing? A lot of these clips He'll put in a short, so you're, you'll be notified, and you can see these coaches talking if you want to skip all us talking. So, uh, <laughs> But be sure to get on there, and if you haven't subscribed, if you screenshot and send it to us, we'll send you a koozie of your choice, and uh, we got to get those ready because I want to see a lot of beer uh, flowing this fall, man. Yeah, and don't forget to reach out to us, our contact, that SEC podcast at gmail.com. Send those on over. Sent out a couple just this week, Shane, so we got a couple hundred more to send out. I mean, yeah. I got boxes of these things, all 14 SEC teams represented. But, uh, hey, buddy, that's going to do it for this episode of the show. I appreciate you as always, and I appreciate each and every one of you for hanging out. We'll catch you on the next one. All right, see you guys. Go balls. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>